PhD, Senior Advisor to the President and Director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Proctor believes that the Robert Wood Fa Johnson Foundation's vision for building a culture of health presents a unique opportunity to achieve health equity by advancing and promoting innovative systems, changes related to the innovative system changes related to the social determinants of health. Dr. Proctor hails from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and his work and studies have taken him around the globe. He began his work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 2002 as a senior communications and programs officer and has done extensive work in the fields of child health and risk prevention, childhood obesity, and preventing teen pregnancy. In 2014, as multiple municipalities and states were reporting signs of progress in reversing the childhood obesity epidemic, Dr. Proctor was reassigned to re redirect to direct the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's work to eliminate health disparities. Ladies and gentlemen, please let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Proctor. Thank you, Madam President. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Can you do it? Congratulations. Test, 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 test. Not yet. I'm going to have to hold it. hold it. Okay. Oh, this is going to be fun. I have to hold it. I have to work the clicker. I have to read my notes. This is going to be a blast. Hello. I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here. Uh, it's, um, I've, been, I've been on the ground here for about 16 hours. And um, what I've been able to tell is that um, I'm in a place with uh, some really special people who really care about their community and are willing to work together to make uh, where they live a better place. And I'm absolutely thrilled by that because if more places around our country uh, did the same thing, our country would be in a different place. And so, but you are an example of what we need. And watching the slides, I also saw that um, I've been with you a long time. I've been with you a long time. I've never been here before. But when you got your childhood obesity grants through the Galvanizing Communities Program, I helped write that program, and, um, and so it was good to see. Um, uh, Voices for Healthy Kids, I helped write that as well. Let's Move, I helped write that as well. And same with the uh, Healthy Schools Program through the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. So I've actually been with you a long time. This is my first time here. Last night, I was sitting around some of you really special people who care so much about your community. And um, my friend, my brother, my colleague, Francis Johnson, pulled me aside. He says, Doc, you know where you're going tomorrow? I said, yeah, I'm going to uh, the Civil Rights Museum. He said, no, 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 you're, you're going to hallowed ground. You're going to a sacred place. You're going to a place of, of uh, deep, rich history. Um, consider it the first stop on the Underground Railroad. And that gave me chills. Because I knew that if these walls could talk, what they would have to say. But then again, these walls probably wouldn't talk. They would probably sing. And they would sing, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. And I'm hearing that in my head the whole morning while I'm sitting here with you all here. Just delighted, absolutely delighted to be here because you have a rich culture, very rich culture. Your culture lives today. If you're, if you're doing this for 10 years now, this is, this is going to be a way of life here. This is a culture that you're bringing in here. You're bringing a culture of health uh, to, to your area in such a bright and vibrant way. So I'm here today to talk to you about the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, what we do, our vision for a culture of health. I'm going to do all those things, and then I'm, I'm going to have, I have a request for you um, that, uh, where you can help uh, me, help the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, get a culture of health all across the nation. So I don't want to spend, ah, I got one more thing. This morning when we uh, saw Dr. Johnson speak, I used to have a photo of him in my slide presentations from about 10 years ago as I traveled the country, talking about different communities that were making changes in different places. This morning was the first time I heard his voice. That also gave me chills. 
So enough about me. <laughs> Let's get on with the business of the day. I'm with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a great place to work, a great place to be. And we are interested in building a culture of health in America. For us, a culture of health is um, that idea that health doesn't have to be difficult. That, um, that you can be healthy as a part of your every day, that you should be able to find fresh fruits and vegetables at a reasonable price that are affordable and appealing in your community, that you should be able to walk through your community, bike through your community, that your children, all of our children, all of our children who are so very special, thank you this morning for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance, that um, we think about our children and our children's health as we're making decisions about everything, about our public policies, right? Okay, about how we all come together together as a community to uh, support and help each other. And we want to make certain that um, we see that across the nation because our understanding, as you understand, because I saw the infographic, that 20% uh, of your health happens in the clinics. 20% of your health happens in the doctor's offices. 20% of your health happens there. So the other 80% happens everywhere else, in your community, in the places where you are. And if we can, um, and if we can have uh, that type of understanding throughout American communities everywhere, then we'll start to focus differently on how we all try to live and live together. So let's see what we have here. I don't know if you've seen this map before. This is Richmond, Virginia. This is um, the life expectancy uh, map uh, produced by Virginia Commonwealth University. And it shows that in uh, Richmond, Virginia, depending on where you live, you can pretty much depend, uh, see how long you will live. So that means that babies born today in Richmond, Virginia living here are gonna live about 20 years longer than babies born here. This is one, one map, one city, one place. Now, I'm not all that familiar with Richmond. I did live in Virginia for a while, but I used that, see this island right there? And there's another island right there. And when I talk to people about our work, I say that you know policies have helped shape these health outcomes, that some of these policies have been shaped on social policy of the past and are still having an effect on life expectancies today and for children. So once again, we're going to go to this island here, this island here, next slide. All right, really difficult slide. This is from the 1930s. This is a map of Richmond, Virginia from the 1930s. Uh, it's a redlining map. Redlining was a practice of uh, drawing, um, uh, showing areas that were worthy and unworthy of investment, right? Okay, so the islands, there's one right there, one right there, okay? Now we go backwards and we look, right? The um, right here, disinvestment. Right here, disinvestment. Right here, disinvestment. Same areas from the 1930s, so almost 100 years ago, Decisions were made that are shaping health and health outcomes today, right? And so we can get beyond that. Um, we don't have a map for Savannah. I wish I did, and, um, and I hope we will have one. Uh, this is difficult to see, but it's the same type of map. It's from 1929. That's Savannah. That's your home. That's where you live right now. Uh, this, most of this means nothing to me because I'm not familiar, right? But what we have here in this legend here is in the lighter green areas, that's where the best investments were to be. Right here, in the bluish areas here, that's where the second favored area for investments would be, here, here, and here. Now, all other colors, yellow, red, and even this uh, checkered box area, these were the places that were called uh, definitely dangerous, hazardous, and uh, not good for business. And if you had a life expectancy map today, I believe that you'd probably see a, a great overlap between what was mapped out in 1929 and, what's, and where um, the areas that you have today. Now, I think that your work is so very important because you're liable to change those trends. The things that you're doing today will impact future generations as they go forward, especially as you continue to build your coalitions and come together as well. Um, I use these maps because it, it helps to show that the policies that we've had in place in the past were damaging in a lot of different ways, lives lost. I mean, and when we think about 20 years difference between these uh, areas and these communities, that's 20 years. That's, that one, it's an entire generation. Uh, two, this, these are people, if you don't live to be, uh, if your life expectancy is to be 63, you may never get to a point of retirement. You may never get a chance to enjoy the benefits of all the hard work that you may have done in your lifetime. You may not have that opportunity to know your grands and your great grands 
because this is where you were living and this is and this is the condition and your environment um, doesn't change things um, for you in that way. Whereas those who happen to live here, they do get to enjoy the benefits. They, as a matter of fact, they get to enjoy the benefits of those people who live here who didn't, weren't able to collect on their social uh, security, didn't have arable income to, uh, to give down to their others. So there are benefits and there are debits based on where we are. And that's how I think about health equity. I think about it in terms of debits and I think about it in terms of assets, financial terms. Many of us are homeowners and we think about equity in our homes, right? And as we're paying our mortgage, we know that that equity builds up. For our nation, we need to have some type of health equity as well so that we can measure the health standards of the United States, compare them to others, and say what are our debits and what are our assets and what can we do to make the country a better place. Let's move on. So here's the situation that we have right now. Nearly one-fifth of all Americans live in neighborhoods that make it hard to be healthy. That means the deck is stacked against them from the um, start. That's 20% of all people living in communities across the country, whether they're in urban areas, rural areas, or suburban areas. 20% of our populations live in neighborhoods that make it hard to be healthy. Not even health neutral, hard to be healthy. If you live here, you're going to have to work a little bit harder if you want to be healthy. So as I go across the country, and this is where I'm going to ask for your help, I have to talk about health equity in different places, different regions, different geographies across the country. And whenever I say the word health equity, many people are with me, many people are not with me. Uh, because the term health equity seems to um, uh, ring something different for them. When I first took this assignment, they asked me uh, if I could write a strategy similar to some of the programs that you all have been involved in to eliminate health disparities in America and gave me four months to do so. And, um, and that's what we focused on. And we said we're going to eliminate health disparities by looking at those social determinants of health, those things that are in our, our lives every day, and look at them as systems. And look at them as systems that need to change. So you take your education systems. How do you repair that so that young people can be prepared to be um, uh, productive adults in our society? You look at systems of access to care, access to, um, to uh, all the things that we need to live, uh, learn, and play. And then how do you fix those systems to make them better? So that's the work we're doing. And after uh, working on it for about a year, I went back to our CEO, I went back to our board of trustees, and I said, we can eliminate health disparities, but the gaps are not likely to be sustained if we don't have health equity in America, right? There, right, right now, there are news reports that say that life expectancy of African Americans are increasing and that the disparities gaps between African American and European American life expectancy is starting to shrink. The other side of that story, though, is that European American life expectancy is starting to decrease, okay? So we can celebrate a shrinking of a gap, but we don't want to celebrate it for the wrong reasons. We want to celebrate it for the right reasons. And so I asked, I said, can we change our focus? Can we focus on, eliminate, uh, on achieving health equity? Because if we can achieve health equity where everyone has the power, the resources, and the tools to make a difference in, in their lives, then the uh, gains that we make in shrinking disparities gaps are likely to be sustained for generations. And um, my, my superiors all agreed and said, okay, Dwayne, you're now gonna um, uh, achieve health equity. So I said, be beautiful, great job security. It's gonna take me a while uh, to get there. So one of the first things we did was uh, we needed a good definition of health equity. We needed to do some research. We found that the United States is one of the only countries um, that focuses on eliminating health disparities, that all other countries in the world focus on, um, on achieving health equity, um, those who are involved in the World Health Organization. Um, but, but the definition that the World Health Organization uses is global and doesn't necessarily um, address the complexities of our American culture. So we worked with um, some researchers at the University of, uh, University of California, and th through their literature, they were able to come up with this definition that a health equity means that everyone in America has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, and housing, safe environments, and health care. Um, I want to focus right here access to good jobs with fair pay. Um, there's a lot of talk in the news about uh, family leave acts, about um, 
a uh, lot of talk in the news about um, fair pay, fair wages. We think that if, um, if we are able to get to a point where people do are compensated ad adequately in a way that they can live off their salaries, that that will help us get to um, health equity. But we can't have a guarantee for fair pay for fair work if we don't focus on our education systems. So that's why we need quality education. We can't expect that people are going to work and work hard and be paid um, well if they live in inadequate housing, in affordable, uh, unaffordable housing, and the like. So for us at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, this is what health equity means. Health, equi health equity means finding the right fix. What works? Um, just as your new president was speaking about being able to make certain that underserved populations and communities get the service and the resources that they need to be healthy, that's being fair and that makes things better. But not everybody understands health equity in the way that I've heard you talk about it today in the way that I think about it. But in Spartanburg, South Carolina, they do. Um, um, Spartanburg, South Carolina was one of our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize winners. Um, I, hope, I hope to see you all on that list uh, sometime real soon. And in Spartanburg, they were dealing with a lot of different challenges. They had a high uh, teenage birth rate. They had um, uh, many of their mills had closed, causing uh, unemployment issues for that community. That uh, their uh, grocery stores ended up closing after the mills left, uh, leaving people reliant on nothing but uh, convenience stores, corner stores, uh, what we call up in uh, New Jersey bodegas, uh, to get foods. And m most of those stores, because of the way that they're outfitted, they're not set up to, um, to keep healthy, fresh foods available. And so the foods that are usually served in, um, from these places, as we all know, are those that are high in f fat, salts, and sugars, because that's what you need to preserve foods. And this is what this community had become reliant on. Very similar to what you all did. They took a look at, um, they took a look at those debits, remember debits and assets, and they said, what can we do differently in our community? And, um, and they started to make some changes. They formed coalitions, just like you all have done here. They, um, they started saying, what are our priorities for our communities in particular? Uh, they uh, were able to get a, a community college to come back to Spartanburg, a $25 million investment there. There's a new uh, hospital and health center uh, that's going in there that's providing free and low cost preventive services for uh, people who are living in their community. Now young people get education on, um, on parenting on, um, on parenting and all the things that go along with uh, making that kind of decision if you want to be a parent. And today they can say that one, their people are being fed, that they have access to high quality, affordable um, fruits and vegetables. Uh, they've got nice places uh, to walk and to be outside. And the teenage birth rate uh, between the years 2008 and 2014 uh, decreased by 53%, 53%. I mean, that's huge, huge. And so very similarly to uh, your work, they looked at their disparities, they looked at their problems, they looked at their deficits, and, they, and, and you could become dispirited by all that people lived, lived through. But they focused on equity. They said, how do we focus our activities on the places and the people who need it the most in our community? They, they thought of solutions, and they worked together to put those solutions in motion. And then they started giving opportunities, because when the grocery stores came back, when the hospital came back, when the uh, uh, community college was open, those became jobs for people who were there as well. And so you get that balance between being able to um, support people, get them to work, and also to live brilliantly in their community. This is the trajectory from disparities to equity. We can, we can spend forever talking about this, wondering how things are gonna change, and we're not gonna get very far. But when we start thinking about this, and then how do we solve the problem? What are the opportunities? It, it brings you hope instead of being dispirited. And you start to think about your future just as you all are th thinking about it well, um, today. I'm hopeful that in about 45 or 50 years when I come back, and, and I will be back, you're gonna be the mayor. Congratulations, I just made you mayor, okay? 40 or 50 years uh, when I come back that uh, Healthy Savannah will be thriving, will be doing very, very well, and you'll stop counting the years because it's just a way of life, just a way of life for your community, and I have those aspirations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I hope that's okay with you. Okay, we'll see. So, 
you all have done the same thing. You've formed coalitions. You've working with all your different agencies that are here. You're about um, Invest Health. And one reason Robert Wood Johnson Foundation invested in and Invest Health and thereby invested in you all is because what your application meant to us. Your application said we're already on this path. We're, we already have uh, done our assessments. We already understand what our communities need. We formed our, what I will call in my academic prose, multi-sector uh, coalitions of leaders coming around the table to solve our problems. So how can we be a part of this? And as you all do your work and what you learn from your work informs the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation so that we can think differently about our investments, but also helps the others in this um, diagram who are um, also a part of Invest Health and other communities as well. We like to share um, quite a bit. That's why I had a picture of Dr. Johnson in my slide, uh, slides about uh, 10 years ago. We like to share what we learn, what we're learning from communities, not just with, um, not just with communities, but we share it with government, whether federal, state, and local. We share it with um, other foundations and philanthropies, and we say, you know what, you look at all these dots on this map right here, these are bright spots where things are happening. And we do so, one, so that all of us learn, but also to make certain that if there are other ways to invest in the work that you're doing, that other people know that um, there, there, there's a bright spot here in Georgia um, that, that is worthy of investment and not disinvestment as we saw in the maps from um, 1929. So this is where I need your help. You all seem very comfortable talking about health equity and I like that. I appreciate it. Many, pe many people in the country are, have not yet gotten there. It is my biggest stumbling block. I spend more time talking about what is health equity um, than anything else. And sometimes I'm effective, sometimes I'm not. Um, I'd, need, I'd, I'd like to request that you all continue to talk about health equity. And, but if you ever have one of those challenging conversations and you get to move beyond that, and a light bulb goes off for the person on the other side and says, okay, I think that you know this health equity thing is not so bad. I, th I think I understand exactly where it's going. Let me know what you said, because <laughs> I, I des desperately need to know, and it's something we struggle with, because health equity um, is often talked about in terms of um, equality. And I, I'm not certain if you're familiar with this graphic or not. It's done by the um, Center for Social Inclusion. And this is what we were using for a long time to show the difference between equality, which is a, a very deeply held American ideal, and equity. And on um, and one side of the, the diagram where you have equality, everybody has a box to stand on, everybody's equal, right? But still can't see over the fence to see the game, okay? So equality gets us somewhere but doesn't quite get us where we need to go because it's not helpful. It doesn't take into account um, the differences that we all experience in the course of our lives. If, uh, e if equality was the rule, everybody here would get a size 10 men's shoe, right? We'd all have shoes, but for many of us, it's not gonna fit and it's not gonna help us and it doesn't do us any good, just like the young cartoon character right here. But then when we have equity, Everybody has what they need. Tall person can see, everybody can see over there, and the tall person doesn't necessarily have a box to stand on. And even this diagram, which we thought was a good diagram worthy of um, starting this discussion, a conversation start, a starter on equality and equity, um, was scrutinized, heavily scrutinized, heavily scrutinized. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, that's about a million on each one of these, right? They said, look, why don't you just get rid of the fence? I said, okay. <laughs> say get rid of the fence you don't need boxes right I said I said you just ruined the metaphor I said, we, we have to have the fence someone said put in a chain link fence aha that was good someone else said why is the ground level isn't the, isn't the issue that the ground is not level that the playing field is not level right and then and then notice nobody is doing anything the only action you know, the arms raised and whatever's happening on the baseball field someone else said why does someone have to give up a box for the other person. That sounds to me like communism. Okay? So I was like, all right, I'm not using that slide anymore. Because <laughs> it, get, it wasn't getting us anywhere. So we, we tried to develop our own slide. And we came up with this one. Uh, equality versus equity, again, talking about equity. Everybody has a bike to ride. But as you can see, it's not the right bike for everybody who's there. Right? Okay? And then we, on equity, everybody has the right size bike to ride. Still, thousand words on this one. Thousand words. All right, first off, why is she riding a bike with a dress on? That was number one. Yet yeah, the little guy, sure, he has a bike and it's smaller than everyone else. He'll always have to pedal twice as hard, twice as fast to get where they're going in the same amount of time. 
Who's the guy in the back? Is he driving things? Uh, are they kidnapping the kid? I mean, like, there were, thou there were a thousand things that came up. They even said, how do people with special needs see themselves in this picture? I thought I had it. I really did. I thought, I thought we had it. We looked. We said, okay, fine. All right, so we changed it. Uh-huh. We changed it. Changed the order of people. Changed, uh, we made certain to accommodate special needs by having like a hand pedal bike right there. Everybody's wearing pants now. We took issues of, yeah, no, right, gotta have it, right? We took issues of um, complexion and order and changed them around to stop the arguments. And I even have a version back in my office that is kind of like a um, 1970s black light glow picture. Like everybody is purple. Okay, and the background is kind of fluorescent green, and so some places I'll end up using that slide because now we don't have the complexion issues. We, you know, everything everything's different, and so these are the great lengths that we've gone to to kind of talk about equity, especially with health equity, and still it doesn't help in some places, in some orders, but we're moving the conversation and that's the goal. The goal is not to convince people to come along, go along and just get along and do that. It's to move the conversation, it's to start the conversation. Sometimes I tell a story about um, two, two teenage boys, uh, one named John, one named Michael. Uh, John, John, both John and Michael are, are very smart. Uh, John, uh, his, uh, his family has made certain to, that he has everything that he needs to be successful in life. He has a tutor uh, that helps him write his papers and helps prepare him for uh, going off to college. Um, John, uh, he spends his summers touring the world, going different places on family vacations, things like that. And, um, and John, John's going to do uh, very, very well. Michael goes to the same school, sits in the same classrooms with John. Michael's, um, he is being raised by his single widowed mother uh, who works two jobs. He doesn't have anyone in his life to help him get through the college application process. He is just as bright as Michael, but needs something different in order to go, uh, uh, to go further in his education and his career. And the thing, the thing about John and Michael is they haven't done anything. None of this is because of them. They, are not, they have done nothing other than to be good students and to um, be what their parents have expected of them. But we know Michael needs something different than John. It doesn't mean that John doesn't get it. It just means that Michael gets what Michael needs so that he and John can go off to college, be roommates together, okay, and uh, graduate from a great school somewhere and do other things. The bikes are just metaphors. They're merely metaphors. You can change the bikes, you can have boxes like we saw before, you can have bikes, you can tell a story about John and Michael to kind of get the point across. Um, it, it, it could be anything, but the, this is the difficulty that I'm having speaking about health equity around the country because I can't get past conversations on how is equality different from health equity. And equality is such a deeply held American value and ideal that we have to get past that in order to get to the other conversations that I have. So my request of you is that if you, if you, if you can think of metaphors that get us through this, uh, my email address is available, send it up, I'll run it up the flagpole at the foundation, I'll, I'll totally credit Healthy Savannah. I, yeah, I will. I'm not gonna take credit for it or anything like that, but it will help us help others talk about these issues so that we can move beyond this conversation of equality and equity and really focus on getting on with the business of um, making our communities better places for everybody who lives in those places. We have a website, uh, cultureofhealth.org. I have a few things to tell you about in terms of resources. So we have a website, cultureofhealth.org. Um, it has on the website uh, stories of communities, just like yours, um, that are helping us to help others understand how communities are um, investing in health, health equity. Um, we, on the website, we also have something we call our action framework. The action framework, our goal, uh, the goal of the foundation is to build a culture of health in America, work with others to uh, get that job done. The action framework that's on the website says how we're going to measure progress, okay? How will we know when we get to a culture of health? These are the things that we're looking at. Um, we have action areas, drivers, domains, and measures. And for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, what this framework um, does is it really gives um, the impression, the reasonable and realistic impression that health is more than just measuring um, blood pressure and all the different types of ways that we measure if we're um, doing better and being healthy. Uh, the action framework measures things like voter participation, civic engagement, 
right? Okay. How involved people are with their communities? Are there um, are there oversight boards in communities? You know, how, how many communities have these things? Are more people taking advantage of the opportunities? Are the systems opening up for folks so that they can actually do better in their lives just by living, just by living, not having to do anything in particular? Culture of health, the culture word in itself. Uh, also is a trigger word for uh, many people. What do you mean by a culture of health? And so we have a vision statement that's there um, on the website. But most importantly, what we've come to understand is that it's not the job of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to impose a culture of health anywhere. Every community, every place has its own culture. You all have a deep and rich culture that you know very, very well. And so we've um, just given a grant to uh, Tuskegee University to uh, do a set of studies that are going to come out in 2018 that um, talk about um, the, Dr. Rubin, I'm trying to figure out how he phrases this now. What are the culture, what are the ethical and other implications of a culture of health in the context of a deep south? And so that report's going to come out um, in December, January. Be ready for it. I think it's really going to help us understand how do we merge and bring cultures together, have intersections between, um, between areas, and we couldn't do better than engaging folks at Tuskegee University to work on this. Three months ago, the National Academy of Medicine in Washington, D.C., um, put out a report called Community-Based Solutions for, um, for, Bill, for uh, Health Equity. Uh, the uh, commissioners involved in that work uh, looked at 109 different communities across the country. The, uh, the, the report focuses on nine in particular, but also looks at those social determinants of health, of education, of income, of wealth, of access to quality care, um, community environment, whether it's social or uh, physical environment, looks at the, those determinants of health and lists out recommendations for the nation and for communities and for states based on what we've learned from communities, not from an academic uh, perspective, based on what communities have told us will work in those areas. So those are three resources that I hope that um, one's forthcoming, the other two are available. I hope that's helpful to you. I could not be more happy um, to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I've already uh, tweeted because that's what I do. So if you saw me over on my phone over there, I was actually tweeting how honored I am to be here at this event. I'm looking forward to uh, going home and seeing my daughters and having them ask me. That, and my daughters, I, I don't know, I, most, many of us are uh, parents, except for the future mayor. Um, and um, my daughters, they call me Dwayne. They call me by my first name. I, I can't stop them. They just do it. And um, so when I get home tonight, they're going to say, Dwayne, where were you? I said I was in Savannah, Georgia. She said, well, what happened? I said, I'll say I met some real nice people who really care about their community that are working very hard together to make where they live a better place. And uh, then we'll go play cards or something like that. Thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciate being here.